feels good. But anyway, let's start with eye tricks. Now, has anyone here seen The Prestige? It's Hugh Jackman movie, I think uh, Christian Bale's in it, uh, Michael Caine. Well, the idea is a, it's a story about two magicians who are rivals at the turn of the century um, in sort of a, I, I guess it's London, but Michael Caine teaches them how to do magic. And he tells them every magic trick has three parts. The first part is the pledge. You show an ordinary object. The second part is the turn. You take that object, you do something to it, you make it disappear, you make it levitate, something happens to it. And the final part of that trick is the prestige, and that's when you bring it back, and that is the technically the most difficult part and where timing is everything. So, if we were to summarize, the pledge, perfectly ordinary quarter. The turn, take that quarter, make it disappear. And the prestige is when you make it come back. So, why do I mention this? Well, I mention it because I used to do magic, as most young lads do at some point in their life, and I have never heard of these terms. The pledge, the turn, prestige, what is this? I personally think that the writer of this movie, Christian Priest, made these things up. And so I thought to myself, well, why can't I make up some things? I mean, they have lots of terms. If you're a poker player, you have, like, your, your tell. If you're a con artist, there's the grift, the grifters. So anyway, I have come up with my own terms. And I want to show you a very disturbing patient. We've all have a patient like this, something insane in the membrane or uh, something wrong with their get along. But they come in and they say, you know, my vision's terrible. I can't see a thing. And they act very, very suspicious. This one more than most. So what tricks can we use in order to figure out what's going on? Well, the first thing is to do this. Realize that the vision, the number one vital sign, if it will, is the cornerstone. It's not a sign, I know. It's, just, it's objective, but yes. Is the cornerstone of our exam. And the problem is it's objective. What one person's I can't see, we know is much different than another person's. So, series of tricks. Trick number one, the handoff. So, you hand them something, and do they grab it? If they grab it, you know they can see it. I can't see a thing. Is there something in front of me? This is the handoff. You can do the same thing with a shake. Hey, how you doing? And if they shake your hand or go to, then you've tricked them. That's the handoff. The pupil check. If someone says, I can't see a thing out of my right eye, it's complete blackness, and they have absolutely no pupil change at all, that's physically impossible. We'll come back to this one in a little bit more detail. Optokinetic drum, do you guys have these in your clinics? Well, Nemours, you probably do because we use this all the time with pediatrics. But the idea is you take a drum with striped lines and you spin it in front of the patient and it's almost impossible not to track a slow pursuit and then saccade and continue following that. If you've ever ridden in a bus, look at the people sitting across the aisle from you. You'll see their eyes are jerking like they've had nystagmas, the optokinetic response. Now, if you don't have a drum, you might have an optokinetic flag like we use in my clinic. It takes up much less space. Sometimes we'll play Where's Waldo? But it does the same effect, and if I was to get closer to you guys, I could see your eyes jerking left and right, up and down. And if you can see an optokinetic drum or a flag, then by definition your vision is probably 2200 or better. Just a trick. The mirror test. Let's say you've got the greatest actor in the world. You've done optokinetic flags, they can't see nothing. You've tried to trick them with the handoff, nothing. The mirror test will break down anyone. I'm very good at faking blindness. I can't last more than 10 minutes or 10 seconds actually doing this. You hold a mirror in front of them and you move it back, back and forth, back and forth. It's impossible not to track an object. And if you look at their eyes and it moves in synchrony with your mirror going left and right, up and down, then they can see something. The flick. Flick your fingers at them. Do they blink? Sometimes I do the flick with light. Instead of flicking my fingers, I'll turn my high beam up to 11, like Spinal Tap. You remember they had the uh, amplifier that goes up to 11? Well, I yank mine up to 11 and shoot in the eyes, and if they can't see, they're, they're going to react. The magic lens. 
This is a little bit more subtle. Let's say you have someone that says, I just can't see very well. They can't get them to read the 2400 line on that near card. You give them a lens. Give them a really powerful one. Tell them this is a really strong lens. It's a plus eight diopters. It's incredible. Hold this thing as close as you want. If they can get down on that card pretty well, then they can see pretty well. Because a lens, eight diopters, I think the magnification of a lens, the equation is one fourth of the lens power. Yeah, it magnifies things twice as much, but still, if they improve a lot, then you know, there's something going on upstairs. Stereo confusion. I can't see out of all my left eye at all. Can't see nothing. Well, you put those stereo glasses on, you say, hey, can you, read the, uh, can you read the dots? Well, you can see the first dot, you can kind of figure out with one eye only because it doesn't work real well. But when you get down to that second or third row, if they can read those things, then you have to start wondering if really they can see. The finger touch. This is a pretty good one. Someone says they can't see, and you say, all right, I want you to hold your hands out and try to get your fingers together. This is a proprioception task. It has nothing to do with vision. See, I can do it with my eyes closed. If they're doing this, you have to start thinking there's something else going on. <laughs> Maybe they've had a stroke. I don't know. Eye popping. This is uh, not so much the malingerers or the fictitious disorder, but this is something you see with children. We all know blink to light, fix and follow. Well, there is a re reflex seen in infants called eye popping. Turn the light off and their eyes open. It's the opposite of the blink to light. It's the open to dark. Eye popping reflex. Check that with the babies if you're having a hard time with the blink to light. Pinhole PAM, very useful test. Do you guys use a potential acuity meter, a crazy thing mounts on the slit lamp? Very hard to use, you've got to plug it in, the doctor tells you to get it because they don't have to do it. Yeah. Okay, well this is an alternative that I prefer. Basically you can do the same thing with a pinhole. Basically have them look through a pinhole, hold the card, whatever they want, extremely bright light to light up those letters and turn the lights off. The room lights have got to be off. But if you have a very bright signal coming through a pinhole, that will often work just as well as the more fancy pinhole or PAM acuity meter. Color caps. You got someone comes in and they have a wicked cataract. Four plus white rock diamond in the eye. You have no idea what they can see. Pinhole PAM doesn't give you anything. They can't see hand motion. They can barely detect light and dark. Well, one way you can do to get a better idea of what their visual potential is, is the color cap. Take those red caps off, put it on a muscle light, see if they can see red. And can they tell the difference between red, blue, green? It's not a whole lot of information, but it is something. It tells you a little bit of info. They can see color discrimination, that's something. The photoptic phenomenon. There may be another name for this. I've actually looked to see if I could find this written anywhere, and I can't find it. But here's the idea. You have a patient has a four plus cataract, they can't see anything. You hold a light up very close to their eye, shoot the light into the eye, through the walls of the eye, and say, can you see little squiggly lines? Can you see your blood vessels back there? Can you see anything? Now, unfortunately, most of the patients that have these bad cataracts are not mentally with it enough to really tell us this, but here's how it works. And you may have noticed this yourself if you've ever had an exam under a slit lamp. Sometimes I can see my blood vessels back there. Here's how it works. Realize that the retina on the back of the eye is like a flat film and your blood vessels course over it like they're hovering over that film. Normally, light comes in the front of the eye in one direction only. It's not coming in the side, it's coming straight through the pupil in. And so the shadow that falls on your retina is always in the same place. Because it's always there, we don't notice it. Is anyone here consciously thinking about how their shirt is rubbing on their left shoulder? No. Because it's there long enough, we habituate, our body gets used to it, the signal is no longer there, we don't even realize it. The same thing happens inside the eye, we have these shadows are always there, we never see them until you take the light and you shoot it in a slightly different direction. The shadow shifts its location on the retina and all of a sudden, boom, you can see those shadows inside your eye by shooting the light in a different direction. It's called the photoptic phenomenon. If they can see their blood vessels, that tells you a little bit more info. They got some vision back there. Something's going on. All right, let's get off vision and talk a little bit about some neuro tests we do. Now, we all have a patient will come in with a bad stroke. They completely lost the vision in one half of their body. They can't see anything off to the left. The question is always, is this a lesion that involves the macula or not? And it's hard to tell because people have the amazing ability to, when they're trying to read the letters on the chart, their eyes are caught up and down, left and right, and they can kind of read the letters by moving their eyes around, and they do very good. But macula involving or not is kind of an important distinction. It affects a lot of things, driving, et cetera, and it tells you where the lesion's at. 
you have to knock out a lot of your brain to knock out the macula because so much of the occipital cortex in the back of the head is responsible for that si fine central vision. So how do you measure it? I do the pencil test. I say, here's a pencil. And on one end, there's the tip. And on the other end is the eraser. I want you to look right at my nose, look right at my nose, keep looking at my nose. All right, I'm going to bring it in. What do you see first? Do you see the eraser? And they say, eraser. And they say, I see the tip. And I see the eraser. You know, it goes right through the back. They're not seeing it until that thing crosses right over the midline. A little bit more accurate than saying, can you count my fingers one or two? So this is the pencil test to detect macula sparing or not lesions. Kind of useful. Neglect. Someone may have a stroke, and the question always becomes, are they not seeing everything to the left, or do they not realize the world exists onto the left? <laughs> Which happens. I mean, it happens a lot. I mean, there's been case reports of people having a stroke, and they keep falling out of their bed, and they finally realize it's because the patient thinks that there's some stranger on that part of the bed. They push their legs off, but it's their leg, and so they follow it. This happens. And so they neglect half their world. This is a big deal. Someone who may have lost half their vision on the left may be safe to drive because they've saccade and they adapt to it. But if someone neglects the left half of the world, you don't want them driving because they're not going to even realize traffic's coming at them. So how do you test it? The pencil test again. You say, I want you to point to the exact middle of this pencil. Point right in the middle. They point way off to the side. You have to start thinking, are they just ignoring the left half of the pencil? They don't even realize it's there. So hemifield neglect. You can also use a pencil. The Hertel, we all know how to use a Hertel, right? The Hertel exophthalmometer. Okay. Well, not much to this trick. Basically, the goal with the Hertel is to get those things as close to the lateral canthus as you can without touching the eye. And then you read the base and you make sure that base is consistent and you measure how far out the eyes are bulging. Not much of a trick there. Except clean them off. Sinus pressure. Headaches. Three things in medicine we're not good at diagnosing or treating. Low back pain, chronic fatigue, and headaches. We all get headaches. We get a lot of patients that come to the eye clinic. Maybe the eyes are causing a headache. Well, usually not. Not that many things can cause headaches from the eyes. One of the things I see a fair amount is sinus pressure causing pain around the eyes. You can push on the sinuses. Push up underneath the eyelid. There's the bone right there. That's the frontal sinus. We all have sinuses. We have them so our heads don't weigh too much. Little air pockets. We also have them so when we face plant into brick walls, we have a little crush zone. It's, a, it's our bumper. But sometimes they get infected and pressure goes up and it causes headaches and then you get referred pain as to the eyes and then come to the eye doctor, signs pain, send them to an ENT or other primary doctor. Myasthenia. Myasthenia gravis and thyroid disease are the great masqueraders of the eye. They cause double vision, blurry vision, droopy eyelids, open eyelids, they change, wax and wane, they come in, they've got crossed eyes, they come in, they've got walleye, they come in, they've got a right hypertropia, the next day they have the left eyelid down. These things are often from myasthenia gravis or thyroid, so we check these things. So, patient comes in, and they say, my eyes get droopy, at the end of the day, do the up gaze test. You hold your arm up and you have them look up and you say, who gets tired first, their eyelids or your arm? And if their eyelids get droopier and droopier and droopier and droopier, you have to start thinking about myasthenia gravis, which is a disease characterized by fatigable ptosis. The more you do something, the more you use the muscle, the tireder and tighter it gets. And these patients often come in with eye complaints because the more they use their eyes, the tireder and tighter they get, worse at the end of the day. Patients usually die of difficulty swallowing, aspirating pneumonia. So it's an important diagnosis, and often the eye doctors are the first to pick it up. So up gaze test. That's a pretty straightforward one. Another test you can use is the ice pack test. So they come in, they got a droopy eyelid, like this gentleman. <laughs> and you say, all right, we're going to put this bag of ice on your eye. Close both your eyes. We're going to walk away and see 10 other patients. When we come back in 30 minutes, <laughs> we want you to take the ice off, open your eyes, and let's see what we see. And don't let them open their eyes before. Don't say, oh, you can, you can open your other eye if you want. Both eyes must be closed. This is a rest test. By resting, you let the acetylcholine build in the synaptic cleft. And if when you come back, you take the eyes off and their eye is open, it's gone away, myasthenia is way up on the differential. You send them off to neurology, get some lab work, maybe some EMG studies, and you check for it. The final trick 
I want to talk about this first little section. It's called eye dominance. This is not much of a trick. Maybe you guys already know it. But whenever you have a patient, they are 20, 60 in both eyes. Which eye do I do first as far as their cataract goes? You want to do the non-dominant eye so you're not messing with their good eye. And so you say, you know what? Take your hands, make a little circle, stretch your arms out as wide as you can. Look at my nose. Look at my nose. That patient is right eye dominant. Right eye dominant. They use the right eye to see you. Simple test. So let's do the left eye first. We'll leave the good eye alone and make sure that other eye goes, does well first. So conclusion for this first little section. A lot of tricks, maybe you're already using them, but I hope you find some of these useful. And it's nice to know them so you can pull them out of your, your hat as needed. Thank you.